what an honor. What, an, what a deep honor. A humbling honor. Yes, this is home. I feel We feel like home. In fact, when I told Amanda several months ago, I said, guess who called today? She said, who? I said, Pastor Joe. She said, are we going back to New Jersey? I said, we're going to try to make it work out. She said, you will make it work out. So there's a, there's a pastor in North Carolina that I'm not there today because I chose Pastor Joe over him. <laughs> oh, it's so good to see you. Boy, last night, oh, we were so humbled to be a part of that. Uh, wonderful graduates of the New Beginnings Bible College. Beautiful. Just I was looking at the pictures today, and just, I congratulate you. You know, I, I was watching the pictures of those of you who graduated the next move, and wow, what amazed me about all the beautiful people last night in the picture and all these, you folks up here, that when we're not accustomed to this in Tennessee, you all have your teeth. That's an amazing thing. I don't know what y'all are drinking or what toothpaste y'all are using, but it's working. You're just beautiful people. You're absolutely beautiful people. What an extreme honor to be here. And I just want you to know that Amanda and I love your pastor and his wife. I know you get to hear him every week. We watch you on weekends. Every weekend, we watch your services. I feel like I'm a member of the church. I know everything that's going on. I know, I know about your school. I know about your businessmen's luncheon. I know about the revival you're having in your youth ministry. I just, it's just exciting. To see. I know about the campuses. So we are just... So, Pastor, when you get ready to launch another campus... And if it's South Jersey, <laughs> count us in, all right? Count us in. If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 8, verse number 5. Uh, I, I need to tell you about a couple of things, and I'm on mandate to get this message out uh, because the Lord delivered me, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, toward the end of this lesson. But uh, in 1986, driving down the highway of our little town, pastoring a little church, uh, a thought hit me, and I couldn't get that thought out of my mind, and it sent me reeling for the next year. Uh, I hardly would get out of my home, bound by depression and anxiety and fear. And uh, my grandmother died in a mental hospital. My aunt died two weeks after getting out of a mental hospital, and I thought that I was going to be able to escape that. I'd never had any problems to that day in 1986 and uh, the Lord delivered me the Lord set me free, free through his word and supernatural and I'll tell you a little more about that but this is my story conquering the chaos in your mind uh, Sid Roth heard about it had me on there um, and uh, over a million over a million people have have seen the YouTube replay of that program it's gone worldwide so this is my story conquering the chaos in your mind Harrison House picked it up. They asked me to write, so we did. So it's out there if you want to get it. Uh, uh, and anybody want this one? Anybody want this one? Well, you want this one, brother? Come up here and get it. You want this one? I'll give this one to you. I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. There you go, buddy. You can have it. That's $20 pay out there. Yet. I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding you. I'm just kidding you. You can, you can have it for free. Pastor Joe will pay for it. All right, now... Last year, I was so thrilled to get hooked up with Rick Renner. Harrison House is our publisher, and he's their, uh, Rick Renner's publisher. And uh, they put us together on an international Zoom conference. And there was like uh, 70 countries involved in that. And myself and Rick Renner and then Kylie Oates Gatewood, who is the granddaughter of Billy Brim. Uh, from Australia. We were all the lecturers on that, and they took some of those lectures and they turned it into a book. It's called God's Path to Mental Health. And uh, so anybody want this one here? Anybody? You want this, dear? All right, you can have this one here. All right. God bless you. Thank you, God bless you. You're welcome. <laughs> if, you, 
If you have your Bible, turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 5 and 6. I want to read it from the New Living Translation. Uh, It's not because I believe it's the only one. It's just uh, the one I really like how it says that, says this verse. Romans chapter 8, verse 5 and 6. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Whether we realize it or not, every one of us place a high value on our space. Our space. In fact, there are people who study the subject of your space. It's called proxemics. Proxemics is literally the amount of distance that people are comfortable putting between themselves and someone else. They call it proxemics. People study this. And and researchers have discovered that there's four different levels that every adult has of proxemics. Four different levels of space. The first space is called intimate space. We all have intimate space. And intimate space is that space that you allow romantic partners and very, very close friends get into. Your intimate space. And it is zero to 18 inches from you. Zero to 18 inches. Intimate space. We all have that. Every one of us knows how uncomfortable it is that somebody who is not a close friend, is not a romantic partner, how all of a sudden they get in your intimate space. And it makes you feel very uncomfortable, especially when they have bad breath. It makes you feel very uncomfortable. So zero, zero to 18 inches is intimate space. And then the next space we all have is called personal space. It's our personal space. Personal space is for friends, but not close friends. People we love and like, but we don't want them in our intimate space. And that is 18 inches to 4 feet. 18 inches to 4 feet. And then the next space we have is called social space. And social space is for casual acquaintances and professional interactions. It's, It's the pat on the back. You know, you pat on that. You can reach over and pat them on the back. That's so social space. And that boundary is from four feet to ten feet. You can touch other people with little effort. Uh, and you can have close interaction and carry on a personal conversation. But they're not, number one, they're not in your intimate space. They're not 18 inches in. They're not in your personal space. They're not four feet in. Now all of a sudden they're at least four feet out to 10 feet out. And then the final space is called public space. Public space. And public space is everything 10 feet away from us and beyond. 10 feet away from, and that's all of our public venues. That's all of our municipalities, our parks, many of our schools, all of our concerts halls, our malls. They are, they are public They are built with public space. You can make eye contact, but you can't touch. You don't have to touch people if you don't want to. You don't have to talk to them. You're far enough away that you don't have to talk to them in a personal conversation. That's public space. So we have intimate space that is 0 to 18 inches. We have personal space that is 18 inches to 4 feet. And then we have a a social space, which is 4 feet to 10 feet. And then we have public space that's 10 feet and beyond. And you say, what does that have to do with it? Because we're all so protective of our space. In fact, you think about it. All the different spaces that we have. We have private space. We have public space. We have retail space. We have play space. We have physical space. We have work space. We have green space. And here's the amazing thing about your space. Every space has its own rules and boundaries. For example, green space. Every municipality, every city, county has green space. You can't build structures in that green space. It has rules and regulations. We have storage space. We have outer space. We have crawl space. 
We have cyberspace. And like my dad told his friends, they asked him, what is he, what's, what's Eddie studying at university? And she, he said, he, he's studying to be an astronaut. And they were impressed. Yeah, studying, man, studying to be an astronaut. My dad said, yeah, he's sitting in class taking up space. So a lot of us just, <laughs> just take up space. So we protect our space. In fact, we make sure our children go to school that's a protected space. I preach in churches every weekend all over this country that many of them have armed police guards outside their children's facilities and, 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 and police vehicles, regular police vehicles at the front door letting people know this is a protected space. You go to any ball game, any concert, any you have a lot of law officers there and security letting people know we protect our space. How many of you have uh, a security cameras around your house? How many of you have alarms? Hold your hand up real high. I've got some guys checking out to see who doesn't. And, uh, but see, the, re the reason we have cameras, the reason we have a is we want to protect our space. So we've gotten very conscious of protecting our space, yet there is one space that unfortunately we as Christians especially have been given the mandate to protect and we have neglected it because we really didn't think that was so important. And the space I'm talking about is our head space. God has called us to protect our head space. The most important space. Yes, our possessions are important. Our vehicles are important. Our homes are important. And of course, our children are our most important possession. But the most important possession you and I have is our minds. That which is behind our eyes and between our ears. We must learn to protect our head space. And there is an attack upon our headspace in this crazy culture we are living in. More than ever before, Satan is coming to deceive our children and our grandchildren and try to convince them in their headspace that God's word is not true. And the Bible says whoever or whatever we give access to our headspace, our minds, our thought life will be that who determines or what who determ who or what determines our direction in life let me prove it to you turn with me to Romans chapter 8 Romans chapter 8 verse number 5 let's read this again we just read it but let's read it again those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things he says if your sinful nature if your carnal flesh is dominating you it's because your mind has been given to that. It's because your thought life is dwelling upon that. See, some of this crazy stuff we see happening in our culture, stuff that we sit back and say, my goodness, what has happened to our world? What has happened to people? If, though, if they'd have done that, if I'd have done that when I was a kid, my parents would have jerked me up in a heartbeat and beat the fire out of me in Jesus' name. And people nowadays are just mad, going mad. Why has that happened? Because Satan is after our culture's headspace. You see, notice what he says. Those who are dominated by their sinful nature think about, think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think, think about things that please the Spirit. See, our challenge as Christians, and Brother Hagin said this, he said the, years ago, he said the greatest need in the body of Christ is for Christians to get their minds renewed with the Word of God. The greatest need in the body of Christ is for Christians to get their minds renewed with the Word of God. He said that 30, 40, 50 years ago. He said that. How much more now? Why did he say that was the greatest need? Because he knew there was coming an attack against our headspace. So the Bible says, so letting your sinful nature control your mind. Letting your flesh, letting worldly desires, letting satanic influence, ungodly influence, letting this culture 
of, of lawlessness and lewdness and sensuality. Let that controlling our mind, it will lead to death. The word death is empty. It means empty, void, and lacking. So if we think about, if we constantly receive in a culture of uh, sinfulness, if we watch it continually on our TV, if we watch it on social media, if we constantly absorb that in our mind, the Bible says it will lead to death. It will lead to lacking, emptiness. But it says if you'll let the Spirit control your mind, it will lead to life and peace. Now see, what we do in the church world, we always talk about the heart. We talk about the heart. And the heart is where it gets born again. And Jesus speaks to our heart. And for the, for the most part, in the church world, we have gotten late to this thing about our mind and our soul. We are late to the game. We've, kind of let, we've let the secular world take care of that. And we don't realize that you and I have the authority in Jesus' name to have a sound mind. Amen. You can have the mind of Christ, the peace of mind. You can sleep at night. The Bible says the memory of the just is blessed. The Bible says he will give his beloved sweet sleep. The Bible says that God has not given you a spirit of fear, but power, love, and sound mind. So all of these things, they are there to attack and interrupt the peace that God wants us to have in our minds. And we have to learn how to do it, how to put God's word to work and access the Spirit's power to make sure that we're walking in everything God has for us and that includes a mind of peace, a mind of peace. As parents, as grandparents, we are insistent on protecting our children and grandparents' grandchildren's personal space. But are we as intent on protecting their headspace? Did you know the Pew Research, P-E-W, Pew Research, just recently reported that 97% of all teens, 13 to 19, 97% of all teens in the United States of America have access to social media. 97% of all young people in America, regardless of what city, what state, regardless of what race, regardless of what economic situation they're being raised in, 97% of all teens have access to social media. And over half of them, over 50% of them, according to Pew Research, ages 13 to 19, say they are on social media constantly. The main social media uh, platforms for young people today is YouTube, I'm a, I like YouTube. I mean, you can, you can fix a commode on YouTube. I mean, <laughs> you can see Pluto on YouTube, or you can fix a commode. It doesn't make any, and everything in between. YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, and Snapchat. Somebody talk, called me recently, several months ago, and said, Pastor Eddie, did you know you've gone viral on TikTok? I said, what's a TikTok? And they said, you don't know? You're viral. Millions of people have watched you on TikTok. I said, I don't even know what TikTok is. They said, and they told me where to go. And I couldn't believe that somebody had taken a segment of my message, my testimony, and put it on TikTok. And millions of people were commenting on that and watching that around the world. They tell us that young people are on TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat. Snapchat and YouTube almost all the time. In fact, according to Common Sense Media, a nonprofit technology company, this is what they've just released that children ages 8 to 12 spend an average of six hours a day on social media. Children ages 8 to 12 spend an average of six hours a day on social media. And then they say teenagers ages 13 to 19 are spending almost nine hours a day on social media. When was the last time you saw your teenager without their phone in their hand? You say, that sounds extravagant. It does, but it's the life they're living nowadays. 
Now, social media is a wonderful tool. I love social media. But it's apparent that the largest influence, the most powerful influence in our children and our grandchildren's life is no longer their teachers. It's no longer their parents. It's somebody we've never met and we have no idea what their values are and they have become the largest influence in our children's life. And every week I receive emails, phone calls, texts, People even driving from other states wanting to come and make an appointment with me to talk about their children who have now all of a sudden think they're transgender. Now all of a sudden they think they're homosexual. Now all of a sudden they're identifying with animals as being a part. They don't understand what has happened to their children. They wasn't raised this way. This wasn't allowed. This wasn't promoted in our home. What is happening to our young people today, they will say to me. Recently, I had a, a family in to see me, and they were talking about their child, and they couldn't understand why their child was so uh, confused, why their child was so messed up, why they had values now that they, in, they did not uh, promote in their home. They had never promoted in their home. And now at the age of 17, those, those children were thinking and acting out ways that they had never seen their family members think and act out before. And I asked them, I said, well, what are they watching on social media? And the mom looked at me and said, well, to be honest with you, I don't know. We don't know. I said, what do you mean you don't know? They said, well, we don't want to be a helicopter parent. And that's the first time I'd heard that term. I said, helicopter parrot. I said, what well, helicopter parrot? What? That's a new one on me. What's a helicopter parrot? I said, and I asked, what is a helicopter parrot? And he said, well, we just don't want to hover over our children and, and watch what they're doing. We, we want to give them privacy and let, let them make their own decisions. And I sat there and I thought, yeah, you're, you're right. You know what? You're exactly right. Well, you don't want to be a helicopter parent. You, you don't want to be a helicopter parent. In fact, you want to be an F-22 <laughs> fighter jet parent. The F-22 is the most powerful jet we have in the Air Force and the Navy arsenal. It carries weapons inside its fuselage. It's got six radar-guided air-to-air missiles, two heat-seeking sidewinders. It carries a 20-millimeter cannon that fires 100 rounds per second. No, don't be no helicopter parrot. <laughs> Hovering over, watching from a distance. When you see something wrong going on with your kids, you dive in and blow that thing up <laughs> from the very beginning. <laughs> and what should concern every one of us parents and we grandparents, what should really concern us is that the information that is influencing our children up to nine hours a day are by people we don't know and they're espousing values that you and I do not believe in. You see, your thoughts determine our direction and our destiny. What your children are thinking about, what your grandchildren are watching, is determining how they're going to believe, how they're going to think, and the direction they're going to go. Our thoughts, the Bible says, those who want to have life and peace have their minds on the Spirit. Those who are heading toward death have their minds on the things of the flesh. And there's a war taking place for our minds. There's a war taking place for your children's minds. Listen, when Eric Carnell posted on his Instagram page, being called a demon is something I can cope with. And being called a trans demon is pretty cool. Retail giant Target partnered with self-proclaimed transgender Satanist Eric Carnell's clothing line. And when they did that recently, it signaled that a culture war in the United States has reached a new level. He said on his own Instagram page, being called a demon is something I can cope with and being called a trans demon is pretty cool. Most of my work focuses on gothic or dark satanic in imagery juxtaposed with bright colors and LBGTQ 
positive messages. North Face. And I love North Face. Use, I have North Face jackets. Use their, their spokesman, a guy with a mustache wearing a rainbow dress. Inviting people to explore the outdoors, hiking, enjoying community, art, lesbians, and lesbians making art. Disney. Advertising a guy wearing a dress welcoming little girls into the enchanted chamber. When biological men and boys are allowed to undress in a girl's locker room with teenage girls standing by, our culture has entered into a state of madness. I'm a huge baseball fan. I love baseball. I love football, but I just wasn't very good at it. I went out for football. I told my daddy, he said, how'd practice go today? I said, they made me tailback. I said, he said, they made you tailback. Son, I didn't know you were that fast. That's, that's a running back. I didn't know you were that fast. Are you sure you're tailback? I said, well, every time I got off the bench, coach said, get your tailback on the bench. So I thought I was a tailback. <laughs> I love football, but I just, my high school coach said, he said, you do run faster in one place more than anybody I've ever coached in my life. So I just wasn't good at it. I, Basketball, short, white, fat boys, they do not, that's not our sport. All my buddies would come in and say, I got the rim today. I got the rim today. I, I say, I got two inches away from the net today. I, I just like to touch the net. But baseball was my sport. I was a huge Yankee fan. When I was a little bitty fella, I remember Mickey Mantle. And that's when I was a Yankee fan. I'm a, I'm a huge baseball fan. I like them all. I love them all. Atlanta Braves is our team. They were the number one until they got in the playoffs, and they choked big time. We love baseball. But I was so disappointed, so disappointed this year when the L.A. Dodgers invited a Christian hate group called the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, whose motto on their website is, Go and sin more. And they invited them to perform at one of their games. It's a group of men who dress up as nuns. And in their performance at Dodger Stadium, in the middle of the infield at Dodger Stadium, they portrayed Christ on a cross. And another guy did a pole dance on that cross, imitating sexual acts while that actor portrayed Christ on the cross. And we sit there with our mouths open and can't believe it. You see, our culture is diving into total madness. We must learn to protect our family's headspace. The source of the thoughts we allow in our minds, in our children's minds, will determine our future. What we watch, what we listen to, what we consume in our minds will eventually determine the direction of our lives and the lives of our children. And the reason I'm so passionate about this, the reason I'm so bold about this, is that I realize that Satan is a tricky dude. And he's taking advantage of what we don't know. You see, I grew up, my granddad was a Pentecostal preacher back when Pentecostal preachers were not popular. I grew up in a strict, holiness, Pentecostal house. My mom didn't wear a pair of pants until she was almost 50 years old. They didn't cut their hair. The women had to wear their hair up in buns. Anybody up here ever know anything about Pentecost? They wear their hair up in buns. They couldn't wear makeup, couldn't wear jewelry because we had to be separated from the world. Okay? We, we interpreted that as holiness. Now, they had good intentions, a little misguided, but I'm going to tell you something. Me and my cousins, we would, we would some of our greatest serv church services was on Sunday night after church was over. We'd go around and pick up the bobby pins off the front door because those sisters, I called them the sisters of Israel, they'd get full of the Holy Ghost and they'd shake their buns down. And their hair would fall down. I want you to know, Pentecostal people have been shaking their buns a lot longer than the devil's crowd has been shaking his buns. 
I grew up, I grew up in a very rigid, strict, never saw, never saw pornography in a magazine. It wasn't allowed. That kind of stuff never talked about sexuality in my home. It wasn't talked about. See, I was taught where to go and where not to go. I was taught what to wear and what not to wear. But nobody ever taught me what to think or what not to think. And the Bible doesn't say it's what you wear that determines who you are. The Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. As a man thinketh. And as a teenager, by some friends in the gym locker room, I was introduced to pornography in the form of a magazine. And that thought grabbed hold of my mind. And those images stirred my flesh to the point that it took a stronghold in my mind. And I fought that thing and fought that thing and fought that thing. Even pastoring a little bitty church, I would have to fight that thing. Nobody taught me how to control my thought life. Nobody told me that the Word of God says, take every thought captive Nobody ever taught me that the Bible says you cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and you bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Nobody taught me. I would not got that far in my study and I was pastoring a little church. And one day in 1986, November of 1986, driving down the highway. Our church was running about 40, 50 people. Driving down the highway, a rogue thought popped into my mind. A hideous thought. A crazy thought. A thought that I'd never thought about before. And it was simply this. Driving down the highway, you're demon-possessed. You're demon-possessed. I remember when that thought hit me. Even though it was years ago, I remember it stung me. It took me back. I thought, where did that come from? I'm not being up with this. I'm the pastor. Where did that, that's crazy. Where did that come from? That night, I went home. Amanda's cooking supper for me and our little toddler. And I walked into the kitchen. And I said, you know, I had a crazy thought today. She said, what? I said, I had this thought hit me. You're demon-possessed. She chuckled. She said, Eddie, you're not demon-possessed, are you? I said, no, I'm not demon-possessed. She laughed. She said, no, you're not. Stop thinking stupid thoughts like it. I said, I don't know why I thought that. Two weeks later, I get, I'm in my office. I get down ready to pray. And as I got down to pray, this thought went through my mind. There's no use you praying. You're demon-possessed. You say, why would you think something so crazy like that? You were a pastor. You were raised in a Christian. Why would you think something like that? Well, let me ask you a question. Why do you think some of the crazy things you think? Some of you believe things about yourself that Satan has whispered into your mind, and you believed them for years, and they're not true. And those things have held you back, and they've kept you in bondage, and they've kept you in fear. Why do you believe the things that you believed? And to be honest with you, that thought, because I didn't know what I'm teaching you tonight, that we have authority to control our thought life, that we can take our thoughts captive. I didn't know it. I just assumed that if it popped in my mind, it must be me thinking it. See, Satan operates in the arena of thought. He doesn't show up in a red devil suit and a pitchfork and ring the doorbell and say, Hey, I'm here. He operates through thought life. Every character in the Bible that sinned, he did it with a, it began with a single thought. How Judas betrayed Jesus began with a single thought. How Adam and Eve committed treason against a holy God, it began with a single thought. Satan operates in the arena of thought. Every sin that you and I have committed that we're so ashamed of, that we're so regretful of, that we're so heartbreaking over. Every thought, it began, every sin began with a thought. Just a thought. And it was just that crazy thought that I didn't know what to do with. 
got lodged in my mind. And within three months, that thought, you're demon-possessed, it had me. It had me. It literally had me. It got me to the point that I felt a, like a vice grip around my head. I started experiencing, back then they called them nervous breakdown symptoms. Today they call them panic attacks. The noise level would intensify. I'd break out in a sweat, just out of the clear blue. My stomach would get in knots. I'd get confused. I couldn't concentrate. And the thoughts would race through my mind like machine gun bullets all day and all night. You're demon possessed. You're going to end up in that mental hospital just like your grandmother. See, the last time I saw her alive, I was a little boy, and I saw her in a padded cell behind the door. And like a zombie, drool, slava coming down her face. She couldn't even recognize me. They had her so drugged out. And she died in that state. My aunt died two weeks after getting out of the same mental hospital. My dad had his problems. And I thought they were just weak. I just thought they, I grew up thinking, what's wrong with those people? What's wrong with those people? And then at the age of 29, that demonic spirit of oppression and depression and fear and anxiety came upon me. Just out of the clear blue. See, the Bible says my people are destroyed for a lack of of knowledge and because I didn't have what I'm teaching you tonight it took advantage of what I didn't know and I got to the point I couldn't sleep at night things literally got dark for me and I'm not talking about spiritually dark I'm talking about physically dark Amanda would come in from work in the afternoon and said Eddie you've got all the lights on and all the blinds are open and the shades are up what's wrong with you I said I can't see it's dark she said Eddie it's the middle of the afternoon what do you mean it's dark things literally got dark for me. I couldn't concentrate. I couldn't remember people's names. I was trying to pastor that little church, but I would never go. She would take me on Sunday morning right before the service start, and I'd walk out on the platform. And the most amazing thing, when I'd get up there and preach, the anointing of God would come upon me, and my mind would go clear. But as soon as I finished and walked off, fear would hit me and say, if you touch those people, if you pray for those people, that demon on you is going to get on them. And I would run back to my office. This would happen week after week after week to the point I wouldn't leave my house. <coughs> Finally, one day after several months, Amanda said, Eddie, you hadn't get out, got out of the house in several weeks. Please, please, get out of the house. Go with us. Will you go with us to the grocery store on Saturday? This was like on Monday. I said, I'll try. She said, try. So every day that week, she would try to encourage me. You're doing good. You're going to be able to get out of the house. The Lord's working in your behalf. We're going to beat this thing. But we, we were limited in our knowledge of how God wants us free in our thought life. Finally, Saturday came. We got up. She said, are you going to go? I said, yeah, I'll go. We went to Cracker Barrel. Glory to God. <laughs> Do y'all have Cracker Barrels in New Jersey? Yes. Aren't they wonderful? Yes. Heaven is in Cracker Barrel. That's good. <laughs> Cracker Barrel will have the catering of the marriage supper of the Lamb. I guarantee you, Cracker Barrel. We're sitting in a Cracker Barrel. My toddler and Amanda on the other side of the table. And I'm, and I'm doing good. I'm fighting it off. The waitress comes and takes our order. And all of a sudden, here it comes. The intensified noise. The nervousness. The thoughts. That band around my head started getting tight. I started rubbing my head. Amanda said, Eddie, what's wrong? I said, I can't. I got to get out of here. Those thoughts were saying, you're demon possessed. That waitress knows you're demon possessed. And she's going to call the police. And they're going to come get you. And they're going to put you in a straitjacket. And you're going to be an embarrassment to your family. And you're going to be an embarrassment to your little church. And you'll never be able to see your family outside that hospital again. I said, Amanda, I can't turn these thoughts off. I can't turn them off. She said, she grabbed my hand. She prayed with me. And I just sat there, look, and I broke out in a sweat. I remember sweating, nervous, started shaking. And I said, I got to get out of here. And I got up and ran out. A minute or two later, here she comes with the toddler. She's crying. The baby's crying. I'm crying. 
We get in the car. She said, Eddie, we got to have groceries. I got to go to the grocery store. I said, you got to take me home. So I went home. She pulled me in the driveway. I jumped out of the car and I ran in. She went on the grocery store. I ran into our little house. I took a right and I fell down on the floor in the den. Fell face first, started screaming, oh God, I'm crazy. I've lost my mind. I'll never be able to go out in public again. I'll never be able to go out in public again. How did I get this way? What did I do? How did I get demon possessed? I, I've loved you. I got saved when I was 10. Why has this happened to me, oh God? Oh Jesus, you got to come and help me. And I wept and I cried. I hollered, I screamed, oh God. Oh God, my life is as good as over. Oh Jesus, help me please. I don't know how long I laid there. I really don't know how long I laid there. I know it wasn't a lengthy period of time, but it seemed like forever. Finally, after a few minutes of just crying, and if you ever cried so much, you just cried out. I just, I didn't have no more tears. And I was just laying there, kind of whimpering, laying on my face. And I sensed something. And the first thing I sensed was, I didn't close the front door. I bet I didn't close the front door. And my neighbor saw me run in. And he might have come in here. I hope he didn't hear me hollering. I hope he didn't hear me hollering. And I lifted up my head. And when I lifted up my head, I saw feet and sandals. And I thought, oh, no. It is my neighbor. And I immediately got up on my hands and my knees. And I looked up. And it wasn't my neighbor. It was the Lord Jesus. And he said, Eddie, what would you have me do for you? I said, Lord Jesus, these thoughts, they're killing me. I can't turn them off. And he said this, Eddie, I told you, thoughts are vapors. They have no power. And immediately I remembered weeks ago one day as I was praying, crying out to God. I kept hearing on the inside. I kept hearing on the inside, vapors, vapors, vapors. And I thought, what in the world does that mean? I am losing my mind. I'm thinking about smoking a stogie. Vapors, vapors, vapors. And the Lord Jesus said, Eddie, I told you, thoughts are as vapors. They have no power. And he reached down to the side of my head. I'm on my hands and knees looking up. He reached down to the side of my head and he pulled out of my head what appeared to be a banner. And on it it read, you are demon possessed. That's the thought that Satan had lodged in my mind. And he blew it and it disappeared like a puff of smoke. And then he reached down into the side of my head, once again to the side of my head, and pulled out another banner that said, God does not love you. Because that's a thought I had. If I'm demon possessed, he must not love me. So I did something. I committed the unpardonable sin. Let me stop right there and say this. I deal with dozens and dozens of people, schizophrenic people dealing with post-traumatic stress, people with multi-personality disorders, people under uh, depression, all type of mental health issues. I deal with them continually every month. And just about all of them have had to deal with this thought that Satan puts in their mind, you've committed the unpardonable sin. You've committed the unpardonable sin. And he pulled that one out. God does not love you. And he blew it. And it disappeared like a puff of smoke. And then he looked at me and he said, Hetty, there's your problem. And he pointed to the corner. And there in the corner, I saw two monkey-looking creatures. Now, I'm young in ministry. I hadn't studied yet about demons or devils. I'd read about them in the Bible, but I, I'd never... I, I wouldn't have known a devil if a devil showed up at my front door. I didn't, but I knew. See, I was in the spirit. Remember what the Bible says 
in the book of Revelation, John said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And when he got over there in that spirit realm, he knew things that he normally didn't know. See, if you ever get over there in the discerning of the spirit realm, get into that spirit realm, you'll know things. And I got over there. That's why I was seeing Jesus. I was in a vision and I saw Jesus. And he said, there's your problem. And I saw two monkey looking creatures. They're about this tall. They had hair all over their bodies. And they were huddled up. And it, Jesus said, there's your problem. I just knew they were demons. How did you know? You've seen them before? No, but see, when you get in the spirit realm, you know things. Remember the Bible says in the book of Corinthians, now we see through a glass darkly, but when we get over there in that rim, we'll see things clearly. Well, see, I was in that rim, and I saw two monkey-looking creatures. And every time Jesus would look at them, you could see their hair on their bodies shaking. They were scared, and they would screak in fear. And a couple of times, Jesus never said a word to them. A couple of times, he just looked at them. And each time, they'd, they would shake, and they'd scream in a hideous fear. And the Lord looked back at me. He said, there's your problem. And then he smiled and disappeared. For the next two weeks, I was on cloud nine. I didn't have a bad thought. I didn't have a tormenting thought. I thought I was free, glory to God. Jesus had appeared to me and set me free. But then two weeks later, the thoughts came back. And they came back with tremendous force. And it was during those next year that the Lord began to teach me from his word some of the things that I teach in this book and what I've shared with you tonight about our thoughts determine our future and our destiny. The only reason I'm here is to share this message with you. Months later, I was in my office and one day just in the, I just went up just went up. I went to heaven. I knew I was in heaven. It's the most amazing experience I've ever had. Colors I saw were just absolutely, they don't, we don't have words for them. And the Lord Jesus hugged me and he said, I love you. I said, I love you. And he, a force started pulling me back. That's what, as quick as it was. He just went up and hugged, to, hugged me and said, I love you, Eddie. I said, I love you, Lord Jesus. It was, it was like liquid love went through me. I've never experienced anything like it. And a force started pulling me back. He didn't push me back. A force started pulling me. I knew I was going back to earth. And I said, I don't want to go. He said, you must go. I said to him a second time as I got a little further back, I don't want to go. I want to stay here. He said, you must go. And then the third time as I was almost out of sight, I said, I don't want to go. He said, you must go back for your wife and your little boy. Now, people ask me all the time, especially since I've been to heaven, do you think my family's thinking about me, my family who's gone on? Do you think they think about me? Do you think they miss me? Can I tell you something? I don't want to hurt your feelings. <laughs> but they could care less about you down there. <laughs> They're so enraptured in the love of Jesus. It's in Him now they live, they move, they have their being. And people in heaven don't breathe oxygen, they breathe love. I had forgotten in that moment's time I was so enraptured in heaven and Jesus and his love. I forgot I had a wife and a little boy. The Lord had to remind me, you must go back for your wife and your little boy and you must go back for them. And I turned to look where he pointed and once again I saw to the side, it, was, it appeared to be thousands of empty army cots. Thousands of them. Empty army cots. And Jesus said, if you don't go back, they will be full of people who haven't heard your story. And they'll be bound and broken and never complete the race that I've given them to run. Simply because... They don't know how to control their thought life. And I'm in New Jersey today. Last week, I was in Nashville. The week before that, I was in Orlando. The week before that, I was in Houston. The week before that, I was in Chattanooga. Next week, I'll be in Dallas, Texas. I never call anybody to ask them to 
come and preach. Never have. People call me because I'm on mandate to tell you, you can be free in your mind. You don't have to live depressed, discouraged, confused, bound by fear, a slave to anxiety. I know it's a world of hell. I know fear has unleashed its venom upon our culture. I know confusion has, is running at a rapid spa, a pace, but God says, He who the Son sets free is free indeed. You can be free spirit, soul, and body, even in your mind. You can be free. Why is it so important to protect your thought life, your head space? Because our future and our direction our children's future and their direction is determined by what we allow up here. Stand with me, would you? I want to do two things. If, you, uh, if you're here tonight and you've been convicted, the Spirit's convicted you, that um, you've been slothful in what you're entertaining in your mind. You've just been lazy about controlling your thought life. They tell us that 83% of all evangelical Christian men visit pornographic websites at least once a month. 83% of all evangelical Christian men visit a pornography website at least once a month. You've been slothful in what you, you've been slothful about what you're daydreaming about, what you're fantasizing about. You've become slothful about you've allowed fear. You've searched something on the news that created fear in you. And fear is reigning in your mind. Maybe you've been in a war and you've had a traumatic moment. And that traumatic moment keeps replaying over and over and over again in your mind. It's called a looping fault. You can't get it off. I want you to know God wants to set you free. But if you've been, just been slothful and say, Pastor Eddie, I've been slothful. I want to ask the Lord to forgive me for slothfulness in my thinking. We're all going to pray a general prayer and I want you to spend that time praying and asking the Father to just forgive you for being slothful in your thinking. If that's you and you've been slothful, raise your hand. Will you? Come on, raise your hand all over the house. Yeah. All right, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I'll pray you just receive. In the name of Jesus, I speak now. I thank you for these people, these people who have been attentive and listening and You've, you've spoke to their heart. You've convicted them. They've allowed some things in their mind. Well, that won't bother. That's no big deal. I'm just thinking about it. Just for a little bit. It won't bother me. It's no big deal. It's, God won't mind that. And Lord, you've convicted them of that. And Lord, we repent. We ask you to forgive us. Forgive us. And Lord, cleanse us. And help us. Holy Spirit, help us to be aware that when we see something on the screen and we want to gaze there and it's sensual Holy Spirit rise up within us and say turn that off yes. turn away yes. when we hear critical words when we hear fearful words and it tries to grab our attentions we say no no weapon formed against us will prosper in the name of Jesus greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world God's not given me a spirit of fear Lord help us we repent of being slothful in our thought life and help us to put a protection, a guard around our mind. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now the second thing I want to do for this. If you're, stud if you're dealing with anxiety or depression. Uh, I want to pray for you. I want to lay hands on you. Now here's what's going to happen. I have an anointing upon my life. I lay hands on people for this. And they'll get a temporary reprieve. A spirit of peace. Mm. A spirit of peace will come upon you. 
but you're not going to get your mind renewed. That's a daily exercise. I can't renew your mind. My mind didn't get renewed that night Jesus appeared, that day Jesus appeared to me. I had to put the word to work. I had to put the word to work. Jesus didn't say, that's my problem when he saw the devils and said, I'm going to deal with it. He said, Eddie, that's your problem. you got to deal with them. And the way we deal with them is take thoughts captive and replacing those thoughts with the word of God. See? But what I can do tonight, I can lay hands on you. And I can give you a jump start. Anointing of peace of mind to give you a jump start. So if you're dealing with any type of anxiety or depression, any type of PTSD, any type of multi-personality disorder, anything like that, and you just want hands laid upon you. Uh, before Pastor, Pastor, I'm going to invite you up and then, well, I'll tell you, Pastor will come and dismiss us. And then after he dismisses us, uh, we'll, uh, we'll pray for those who want to come forward. Uh, okay? We'll pray for those who want to come forward. So, honey, you're going to dismiss? Come on up here. Didn't she do a phenomenal job? Man, what great worship. What great worship. So, so go ahead and dismiss the people. And after she prays or whatever we do to dismiss, Y'all just come forward. Those who want prayer, come forward. Here's the only thing I ask is, is while we're praying up here, if you want to talk and fellowship, be sure to do that out in the foyer. We want you to stay around, hang out all you want to, buy 17, 20 books, whatever you want to do back there. Uh, hang around, and, and, but just give us some quiet up here to minister to people, all right? Amen. Thank you, Bear. Amen. Um, will you be, please be seated just for a moment? Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so much, Pastor Eddie. Um, how many have been impacted by th his word? Am this the word? Amen, amen. And so, what we always would, what we always love to do at New Beginnings is we love to sow into ministries. And so, he's obviously just like he mentioned, he's been traveling all over. So, this is an opportunity where, if you like to give, um, we will collect all the offerings. And at the end of the weekend, we will present Pastor Eddie um, and his wife with this offering. And so, really, um, you can um, you can actually um, fill out an envelope in the seat pocket in front of you, or you can give online. Um, there is an option in our giving tab um, to also give towards our guest speaker. Um, as you prepare um, the offering for our guest speaker, um, remember, we may not be able to go wherever he and his wife are going, right, to spread this message. But when we partner into the ministry, we're depositing seeds, right? And so this is a beautiful thing that we get to do. And if we've been blessed by it, and I know that I have myself, but I'm sure there are so many others, and, and I'm ex we're expectant that there are people who will be set free, amen, and who have been set free. But um, so it's just a beautiful thing that we can partner with this amazing ministry as they continue to be obedient to God's call on their life. Um, to, to bring the word of God and to spread um, this message of healing. Um, just a few things that stand out to me based on what he mentioned. Um, we have authority to control our thought life. Amen. And he also mentioned, fill our mind with the knowledge of God. We perish because of lack of knowledge. So we fill our mind with the knowledge of God and the knowledge of God, the truth of the word of God, that's power. Amen. Um, and lastly, thoughts are vapors. They have no power. Our thoughts determine our future and destiny. Amen. Let's pray. God, I thank you, Lord God. I thank you for Pastor Eddie and his wife and his beautiful family. I thank you, Lord God, for his boldness um, um, to continue to be obedient unto you and share just your deliverance in his life and just the truth of who you are, Lord God, and the authority that you've given us um, and given him, Lord God. And Lord, um, we pray, Lord God, just... Um, that his ministry will be blessed and it will continue to reach the thousands upon thousands of people that you've, um, you've, you've, you've told him to reach, Lord God. Um, and so we just thank you. We thank you, Lord God, for divine health over him and his family and that they're continually blessed, Lord God, as they continue to walk in obedience unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Ushers, you may receive the giving. Amen. Thank you so much for being here tonight again. Um, as Pastor Eddie mentioned, 
Um, he would love to pray over anyone who may have been experiencing any of those things, anxiety, depression, PTSD, whatever um, thought controlling issue. He would love to pray with you. Um, and just be blessed. Amen. Uh, if, you ha- if you know anyone who, ha- who needs to hear this word, we have our services tomorrow, two services here, 9-11. We also have our Bayville campus that will also be um, having this message broadcasted at um, 10 o'clock. And as well as our wall campus will be having this message broadcasted at 10 o'clock. Amen? Amen. Um, God bless you. Um, after the offering is dismissed, actually, we'll just pray. God, thank you for this um, congregation. Thank you, Lord God, for your word, Lord. Thank you for, um, we just ask for safe travels as they go home, Lord God. And Lord, we just thank you for the impartation that you've deposited inside of each one of us, that we can walk in authority, Lord God. And as we're set free, you, you've set us free, Lord God. Let us walk in boldness, Lord God, to set others free and bring the message of Jesus to those around us. In Jesus' name. Amen. And if you need to receive prayer, please come up. We would love to pray with you. Everyone else, you are dismissed.